I'm Bill Edens. I'm a Paulus father stationed here at the cathedral. I see some lovely cathedral parishioners here and also some other people too. And this talk is on resilience. And this talk is only as good as the audience. <laughs> so welcome to all of you in computer land who are watching this. Um, thank you to Irene who's putting this live, live, is it stream? Live stream and also on video. Okay, so great to see all of you here. And we'll start off by just getting to know each other a little bit. Would you please tell me your name? And what drew you here? What drew you here? Starting over here. Um, my name is Melissa, and I've come to all three of these, and just sort of testing the waters a little bit. Great. Thanks, Melissa. Bill Dykstra, <clears throat> why I came is in regards to resilience. I'm dyslexic, and I have a really hard time in our education system. So, to be resilient in that. Thank you. Okay, Tokayos. <coughs> they say in Spanish, Tokayos. It means you have the same name. Yes. Bill and Bill. Yeah. Tokayos. Tokayos. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. And I'm Norma Blanchard, and I've come many times to the talks, and I've enjoyed every one, and this just really sounded like something I would be interested in. Great. My name is Zach Miller. Um, this is the second one of these uh, classes, if you will, that I've at the CIC. been to at the CIC. Oh, okay. yep. And it's uh, the last one's interesting, and this one sounded interesting as well. Okay. Thanks, Zach. Let's mm -hmm. go back, Alex. I'm Noreen Simmons. I worship at the cathedral, and I am here because after my long medical journey last year, I think my resilience man has been kind of in hiding, and I was hoping you would help me find it again. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to help each other tonight find the resilience. Okay. Noreen. Yes. Yes. Okay. Next to the back. Um, I'm Kathy, and um, the topic of resilience is just very interesting to me. I'm getting old enough that I've been through a few things, and um, nice. always good to know. Um, this, where the strength comes from and, and how to continue. Oh, great. Okay. Nice. And I'm Rachel, and my mother sent me the link to this, and it looked like something I would enjoy, too. So. Great. Okay. So wondering where the strength comes from, and then passing it on to your daughter. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. <laughs> uh, starting her back. Uh, my name's Eric, uh, and I saw the pamphlet and thought it looked interesting. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks Eric. Um, I'm Emily, and I heard about this opportunity from um, my professor, Dr. Marco, and figured resilience is an important thing for our day and age, so it would be important to hear a talk on it. Okay, good. So we're all just kind of hovering around the edges of like, oh, this looks interesting. <laughs> but what I'm hoping is that you'll really get involved in this tonight, because it's, it's really not so much about talking about resilience as getting into what it means in our lives. Okay. Uh, Robert Marco, um, I've heard you before and as a homilist in one other session. And you still came back! Yeah, I still Whoa. came back. I still came back. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm not very bright. Uh, but, uh, yeah. And I think it's important. I think, uh, I think there's a book. It might not have been on resilience, but in terms of resilience that I've, I've seen in the past. And I think there's something to that. Great, thanks. Uh, my name's Erin, um, and I am here because I tend to be um, super black and white, mm. and um, like if one thing goes wrong, that means everything is wrong. So um, I'm hoping that this will kind of help with help with that a little bit. That's what's that called? Catastrophize. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll sign on as a card member to that one. <laughs> okay, Barb. My name is Barb, and I'm. I come to quite a few of the meetings and I always go away like I'm really filled with the spirit and filled with a little bit of knowledge that I didn't know anything about. So I enjoy coming to them. All right. Good to have you, Bob. I'm Gloria and I came tonight because I'm coping with old age and I've never done that before. <laughs> and the many challenges that it is presenting to me every single day. That's a good line. Yeah. I'm Nancy, and we've also come to many of these classes, but I, I find myself, as I am getting older, and then as grandparents of two little ones, um, seeing the, the dynamic of what my 
daughter and her family are going through and you have to have resilience in raising kids and letting them go and getting older, so it's a good quality to nurture. All right, okay. <clears throat> I'm Frank and uh, I'm Nancy's husband. Okay. And she said I could use more of it. <laughs> so I'm here for that reason. I come I have a master's. I should get a master's. I come I've come for a number I come for a number of classes. I had with them. So and the Paulists really know how to make you resilient, I think. So that's good. I need that. Okay. I need a shot of resilience today. Okay. I'm hoping you'll participate as well. I hope so too. Good. Okay. Yes, I'm Darlene, and I, I've been to a number of different classes and presentations, and I thoroughly enjoy Father Bill, and um, it's quite, how do you say, apropos that this is tonight, because um, there are several challenges in my, in my family, and I want to try to be supportive, but not a, I feel like um, I need something to help me to cope and not overdo on being supportive with them. Great, thanks, Darlene. Well, it's delightful to be together this evening. And I do hope, as you've noticed, if I've done presentations before, is I try to get you talking to each other, so, especially to somebody that you didn't come with. Well, we'll get to that. I didn't come with you. Pardon? I didn't come with you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, okay, here's our button. All right, so. I do you like to use PowerPoint, so virtue of resilience is the talk tonight. Yeah. Okay, so, do you know what they say when they talk about the oxygen mask? Yes. What? Put your own on first. Put your own on first. Okay. Guys, my, I talked to my sister this afternoon and I said, Aunt, and she's the veteran of many crises in her family, and this is what she told me. Bill, if you don't take care of your own needs, you're no good to anybody else. So, Anne. Ann Bell is my sister. So it does seem like selfishness, though, doesn't it? Taking care of me. Oh, I need some time off. Actually, I'm going on a retreat next month, and I do need some time off. But it does seem like selfishness, right? I've got to take care of myself. But if you don't take care of yourself, then you as the self are not going to be there for the other person. It bears repeating. This is what Ann says. What we're doing here is called a forced resilience. You get up every day and you take care of the stuff that comes at you and then you go to bed again. <laughs> That's where she's at right now. She, she needs to be at the class. I think she should be here tonight. I really think so. she got some good ideas, but we need to inject some joy into that. Uh, okay, here's what Paul says. <clears throat> Let's see. Frank, would you read this one out loud, please? Nice and loud. <clears throat> if I could do it. Suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. That's Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 3. Thank you. And isn't that amazing, putting those words together like that? <coughs> Starting with suffering. And actually, I gave a talk to the charismatic <coughs> community on Monday night. We were talking about the gifts of the Spirit, and we, we talked about all kinds of gifts. And I said, <coughs> now, the three gifts I want to leave you with are this. Suffering, darkness, and emptiness. <laughs> Those are the gifts. And here's one of them. Suffering <clears throat> produces endurance. Depends on the person, though, doesn't it? Because it can also just, you can just fall apart. So suffering, if you respond to it in a certain way, produces endurance. Endurance can produce somebody that's just rigid or bitter or whatever, but it can also produce character. And character produces hope. And we're going to talk about hope a little bit later. Anybody know who that is? Mandela. Nelson Mandela! Yes, my hero. This is when he was younger, of course. And uh, he got involved in actual militant re uh, re reaction against the apartheid government in his early days. And so he and his buddies ended up in jail. And they were actually given the death sentence at first, but then it was commuted. I don't know the facts on that, but that's what I heard. And uh, <clears throat> here's one of the march, one of the demonstrations, demonstrations uh, against the apartheid government. In prison in hard labor for 27 years. And this is so amazing that he came out neither subdued nor embittered. 
Released from prison at the age of 72, he went on to be elected president of South Africa. And one of the things he insisted upon against his black supporters' <laughs> wishes was everybody is going to be included in this government. African or whites, blacks, different tribes, everybody is represented. He came out ready to work with people to lead a democratic government at the age of 72. Now that's got to be resilience. I mean, to first of all, hard labor. And it kills some people. Yep. On Robben Island. Yeah. Many people die doing hard labor. He came out, but he still had his ideals in mind. He was not bitter, but ready to work with people. So he orchestrated the end of social apartheid. He initiated the truth and reconciliation process, which was able to get the truth out in the open of the things that had happened. And he brought social healing to his country. And nothing's perfect, and they're struggling now. But just that person is able to move beyond the bitterness that surrounded him. There he is. Now, who's that? Is he? Uh, I was thinking that might be De Klerk. Is that De Klerk? Yeah. <coughs> Is he still living? No. No. Oh, he did, he died. Okay. Well, well into his 90s. <clears throat> the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats. It means bouncing back from difficult experiences. So that's the psychological, American Psychological Association definition. <clears throat> so adapting. being able to try something different. Not doing the same thing over and over and over again, but adapting in the face of trauma, adversity, tragedy, <clears throat> and threats. Bouncing back. But how do you do that? Because that's the goal, I think, to be able to bounce back or even to bounce higher. Here's the story of two shipwrecks. 1864, two stormwrecked ships were cast up on different coasts the same inhospitable island where each would spend the next year unaware of each other. The crew of one ship abandoned all formalities from the past and they adopted group problem solving. They worked together to find food and water, constructed shelters, finally built a small boat that brought them to safety. The other crew, however, retained the formal hierarchy that served them so well on the high seas. Rigid hierarchy. But on the island, they fought and splintered. They lost 16 of the 19 to cold or hunger, and the three survivors only rescued by chance. And this is from a paper from the American Psychologist magazine by John Capaccio, Harry Reese, Alex Zoutra on social resilience the value of social fitness with an application to the military. So you start thinking, oh, military resilience, you know, how do you come out of the trauma of that and somehow readapt and become integrated into society again? But they were looking at it in terms of the social network. How do we build social networks that are adaptable, that help you thrive? <clears throat> to prevail in the midst of unexpected challenges, demands a flexibility that risks disloyalty to the traditional ways of performing. <coughs> wow. And then he starts to ask all kinds of questions. Well, Vatican II, hmm. <laughs> they risked, what's the word, disloyalty to the traditional ways of performing, caused all kinds of chaos, and eventually got people to take responsibility for their faith, to take part in their faith. It really um, it was difficult. It was very tragic for a lot of people, the way it happened. Uh, they weren't introduced to the changes, they were just changed. And uh, sometimes it's very hard to let go of our traditional ways of doing things. Uh, Karen Armstrong, she says, human beings make sense of the world by telling stories about it. Telling stories is the most natural and the earliest way in which we organize our experience and our knowledge. Okay, I want to put a, what's the modern form of storytelling? One of the modern forms of storytelling, other than the moth. <laughs> you don't know what the moth is? Yeah, some people know. The moth is actual storytelling that's done in cities around the country. Yes, yes. And they give you so many minutes and 
It's really fascinating. But anyway, the other form of storytelling in our culture, one of the other forms of storytelling is... <laughs> Facebook, okay. YouTube. YouTube. Twitter. Twitter. Okay. Movies. What? Pardon? Movies. Aaron, yes. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to give a little movie clip. <clears throat> Can you tell me if you know which movie this is? <clears throat> There's a Mozilla Firefox uh, to the left. It's a little note back to the right. That one. Right, right, right. Let's go to that one. Think about that one. Brilliant. <laughs> That's why you're exactly That's here. Uh, That's why you're in the front row. That's why right. 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 I, I don't see the one you're looking for, but. <clears throat> oh, Zach, you just got fired. No, here it is. <laughs> here we go. Don't look at the name. Oh, too late. <laughs> too late. How do we go to the full screen again? There. Mm -hmm. Oh, and how do we start? We go like this? <laughs> okay, so we we're talking about storytelling and about social networks. <coughs> Ronnie. Have you come to make peace with me? Yes. You may not want to. Oh, Ronnie, of course I want to. But, Johnny, I mean, your mother was dying. How did she recover? I told my mother we would have been married. And she got well right away. I'm sure she did. It mm -hmm. was a miracle. Oh, yeah, Johnny, yeah, yeah. Miracle. yeah. Johnny, I, I have something that I have to tell you. And I have something to tell you. But I must talk to you alone. No, I, I need my family around me now. <clears throat> Loretta, I can't marry you. What? If I marry you, my mother will die. Well, what the hell are you talking about? We're engaged. Loretta, what are you talking I'm about? I'm talking about a promise, okay? He proposed. Because my mother was dying, and now she's not. Oh, Johnny, you're 42 years old. She's still running your life. And you are a son who doesn't love his mother. You are a big liar, okay? Because I have a ring right here. Well, I must ask for that. Thanks. Uh, I, uh, you know, all right, the engagement is off. In time, you will see that this is the best thing. In time, you'll drop dead, and I'll come to your funeral in a red dress. Loretta. What? Will you marry me? What? Uh, where's the ring? Johnny? <laughs> Can I borrow that ring? <laughs> oh. Thanks. Loretta Castorini. Will you marry me? Yes, Ronnie. In front of all these people, I'll marry you. Do you love him, Loretta? Ma, I love him awful. Oh, God, that's too bad. <laughs> she loves me. What's the matter, Pop? I'm confused. out in family. I love that. Family can be resilient. It can be a place where you're not alone. Even if you don't fit in quite right. Ah, oh, come on. You're part of the family. You're with us, you know. It's a way of people work things out. It's a way to be resilient, to be carried through life in a family. And I think we miss a lot of that nowadays. Certainly miss it in my family because we're spread out all over the place. But, and those are some of the forms that maybe don't work all the time. But it's a social form that helps us be resilient, to handle the difficulties of life. Nancy and I went to this movie back in the 80s, yeah. late 80s, with an ex-door neighbor's husband and wife, young couple, who are now divorced. 
<laughs> so that's that's uh, that they need more resiliency. So they weren't Italian. A little late. They weren't Italian. Well, there was um, <clears throat> a part of that I didn't see it, uh, where because the husband's been going out on her to visit with another woman, and she she says if she finally looks at him across the table in the midst of all of her children and everything, she goes, "I want you to stop seeing him." <clears throat> Slams his hand on the table, stands up. Says, "All right." <laughs> that's what yeah. yeah, that's the father. That's and he's, the father. Yeah. yeah. So in the midst of being caught by his daughter at the theater with this other woman, <laughs> she shames him into it, and then his mother, his, his wife, asks, and then they get leaves the woman. He can they get back together again. Does anybody remember anything else about that movie? I never saw it. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good one. I think he went into some kind of a diatribe about a wolf and losing his hand and right. he's a baker or he's something. A baker. Yeah. He's a baker, he lost yeah. his hand. Yeah. 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 Blamed his brother. He blamed his brother. And blamed, oh really? I don't remember that part. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great, okay, so that's a story. <clears throat> Is anything moving within you? Are you thinking anything? No. This might be a good chance to ask. Is there anything coming up in you about your life? It's all right. We're among friends. All right. Well, maybe we'll do it this way. Yes. Well, I was just thinking, my, my father passed away last year on the 4th of July, and he was 90, almost 92, and toward the end, his stories <coughs> that we'd all heard so many times, you know, as he got older, they became even more important to him to talk about. He was one of 11, children, 11 boys in his family, so he would tell us these stories of growing up, and they were as clear as could be. You know the memories oh. that he had of, oh. of growing up with all I'm his brothers. I'm jealous of that ability, but yeah, yeah. That's great. And um, the 62 years he had with my mom before she passed away. And every once in a while, I, he told he told one story near the end that I had never heard before, and I was just flabbergasted that I said, how come I never heard this one before? But um, it, it was it, very important. And I find when my family gets together, we do we we share the same stories over and over again. Frank does that with his relatives too. I, I get sort of like, how do you, how, you guys have told this 27 times. And, but it's just that sharing of a, mm. it's that shared. The shared history. It's just shared history. <clears throat> Storytelling. Yeah, like Karen Armstrong says. Yeah. We make sense of life by telling stories. Let me see if I can move this to the next thing. <clears throat> Okay, a couple more stories here. Gabrielle Gifford, remember her? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the congresswoman from South Arizona was shot with an attempted assassination. Um, she was speaking at a small gathering at a mall in Tucson. Shot her in the head. Six persons in the crowd were killed and a number were wounded as well. She and her husband were proud gun owners. She says, uh, would somebody read this? Norma, would you like to, Norma, would you like to read this out loud? Many may look at me and see mostly what I have lost. I struggle to speak. My eyesight is not great. My right arm and leg are paralyzed. And I left a job I loved, representing Southern Arizona in Congress. So she had a goal in life. She wanted to be, for several decades in her 40s, she wanted to be a US representative and take care of the concerns of her people and move the government and so forth. Uh, Darlene, would you read the next one? I thought that by fighting for the people I care about and loving those close to me, I could leave the world a better place, and that would be enough. So then December 2012, Sandy Hook, high school shooting, or the school shooting takes place, puts something in her path that she didn't expect. <clears throat> uh, would, you like to see, would you like to read this? Okay. December. 2012, Sandy Hook school shootings would provide Gifford path. It shocked me, it motivated me, and frankly, it showed me a path. And then she and her husband went on to be very prominent 
in promoting greater <coughs> gun safety in the country. Mm -hmm. So her life was changed by a drastic challenge to her life, and but it also was the seed of something new. And I think that's why I said, you know, suffering is one of the gifts, because it's loss, but it's also a seed for something new. Each negative event a person faces leads to an attempt to cope, which forces people to learn about their own capabilities, about their support networks, to learn who their real friends are. And a lot of this material I'm taking out of this book that you might find interesting, called The Virtue of Resilience, by the Whiteheads. Has anybody heard of the Whiteheads? <clears throat> James and Evelyn Whitehead. Great presenters over the years, for decades. I don't know if they still are. This is one of their books, The Virtue of Resilience. And they've got some wonderful stories in there. <clears throat> um, one of them they talk about is Malala Yousaf. Yousaf. Oh, Malala. Yousaf. Does anybody know this story? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Would you read this part? Kathy. Kathy. I really can't. Well, can't see it? I can now. <laughs> okay. October 2012, Malala Yousafzai. Yousafzai boarded a bus to go to school in the Swat district of Pakistan. Despite the severity of her wounds, the 15 year old rallied in Pakistan and then in Birmingham, England. Mm, okay, the story is a little, I skipped a few points in the story that are important. She was shot and it was an attempted assassination and the bullet went into her head and went around in her brain and she was able to recover from her wounds. But the part of that is youth, she was 15. <clears throat> you have a lot of more physical <clears throat> ability at that age to regenerate than uh, <clears throat> most of us here do. There she is, one child, one teacher, one book, and one pen can change the world. So this launched her onto this tragedy that became known internationally, launched her into a whole new career of promoting girls' and women's education in the Muslim world. Okay, I think we had that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. She began to speak out, taking advantage of the international platform that the assassination attempt had provided for her. Now this part adds another element. At birth, her father had named her after Malalai, the woman acknowledged as the greatest heroine of Afghanistan. A 19th century warrior had given her life in rallying Afghan troops in their victory over the British. He named her after a famous hero of their country famous woman hero. Malala, Malala's family, father, this goes to your point, Nancy, never tired of retelling the story of Mamalai, Malalai, reminding his daughter of the tradition of valiant women to which she belonged. The historical model nurtured Malalai's resistance. She was part of a bigger story. <clears throat> we realize the importance of our voices only when we are silenced. Okay. So let's stop right there. Uh, what I'd like to do is everybody stand, please. <clears throat> okay, now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to find somebody that you did not come in with, and I want you to talk about anything that has been stirred in you by what you've heard so far. Okay? Find somebody you did not come in with. I'm going to give you a few minutes to talk. <clears throat> talk to somebody about what you've seen or heard. Family and friends, help the 
I'm talking about her getting shot and she lost all of her hair. And I didn't appreciate Terry with me. I didn't appreciate my hair. She felt both of them back. And I strive to do what? It was actually on an island. More of Thank you for having me. I think that's a good thing. Because you have a little bit of a cheese bowl. And she was saying, 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 she was I look at the suffering that Helen yes. Keller had to go through and saw the impact of that had to go through. I'm still here myself. 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 Being dyslexic, she had to really on her mind that you know she was dyslexic. She was deaf mute, but no, she was no, no, And yet Annie was like limited now. She was focused. She used to work at Target. Our human resource director was a manager. Eventually, I just I realize no matter what, I can't even about it. And they take what I would say, take what I would do. Yeah, she would not be happy if she were sitting in an office. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She did, she had somebody that was on that list for her. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, and, uh, they do prison ministry and a lot of people that they heard of prison. They don't want to take their own And it would have been surprising. In some families, in the inmates, Yeah, my other daughter's not very good. She had nothing to do with her. She traveled a little bit, but not much. She's one of her friends. I knew a grandson that was born on Friday. I have a reason to show you that. When we finish, experts come in there. But I think she's a player. And I think that they have public for people to step out. I'll say how we're doing. We have to have the nurse. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right in front of us. Yeah. It's more funny. 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 something you would like to share with a larger group because really it's telling stories right mm -hmm. to help us through this I've heard from at least two people oh I thought that what I was going through was terrible but it's nothing compared to what I just heard about <clears throat> no it's big for you it's big it's big because that's what you have to confront 
Yeah. Well, I don't want to say it's terrible, but it's uh, it's overwhelming for me, and it's nothing com to me from what these people have yeah. gone through mm -hmm. and how they've overcome and moved on to do such great things. Yeah. Well, maybe maybe the stories are a little overwhelming in that sense. No, I don't mean no. My, <clears throat> my, my stuff is it's a, it's kind of draining me, but it's mm -hmm. not. I'm very blessed, I'm very thankful, but I, I don't want this to, um, how do I say this, it's kind of embarrassing, I thought, am I, do I, am I mentally ill because it's starting to take its toll on me a little. Mm -hmm. and, that, and I've heard that with the, the um, oxygen mask, a front, good friend, girlfriend of mine has said you, what you were sharing, you, you need to put that on in order in, to take care of yourself in order to give any help to other people in your life. Okay. Anybody else have a response? We were talking about our daughters oh, yeah. and the risks that our daughters have taken that maybe we might have been too, um, too concerned about safety and home to have ventured out. Like I think of uh, my daughter, our daughter Mara who spent, she's got a, a degree, a master's degree in public service and spent a summer in Nicaragua um, working on an island with women who had been, uh, had been victims of domestic violence. And she's gone to Colombia and, and Guatemala and a lot of places to do that kind of outreach. That, and, she, and she suffers from type 1 diabetes that she was diagnosed with at an early age. And yet I think that the resilience she had to have to to be able to um, take care of herself and to be healthy with that has opened her up to doing things that I might consider more risky. Mm -hmm. that, yes. Uh, yeah. Isn't it mm -hmm. interesting that personality has a lot to do with it? Mm -hmm. but even personality of infants. You can see in the infant if they're going to be adventurous or if they're going to be really... Yeah. Um, that's what you were saying about your adventures. Yeah, that's yeah. what we were sharing because my daughter has traveled all over the place. And she still does, and, she, and situations that she has been in, it was like, uh, she was like that as a child. You know, even when she was three, I'm going to go to the store and get you a newspaper, Dad. I'll get it. And, and we're going, you know, and so my husband kind of let her, and he followed her. But, I mean, she was like this. She was never afraid to do anything. And, and I always really knew, always, yeah, yeah. And I always knew that she would be the different one, and she is. It's, it's followed her all of her life. So some of it is just there. It's personality it's there. from it's, the very it's, beginning. It's, yeah. uh, for her it was. Yeah. Uh -huh. She was uh, always wanting to be adventurous. She took off at 19 and went to school, you know, out in Seattle. And I know she was never going to come back as, as my child. Mm -hmm. She never did. She just, you know. She blossomed, in other words. she blossomed. Right. Yeah. Okay. Anybody here face your own situation where it needed resilience? Yes, I've had to do that in my life. But as a, a young, young Catholic boy growing up, you know, hundred years ago, um, you, you were you were not you were really not supposed to be worrying about resilience. You do what you're told hmm. from the teachers, from the priest, from the church. I mean, exactly. There wasn't any there wasn't any space uh -huh. for thinking on your own. You do what you're told, whether you like it or not. And that, that's the way it came across sometimes. Now, yeah, and I was kind of at yeah. the, the cusp of that, moving yeah. into the next generation, which was, wow, everything goes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> which we went through that, of course, and it was, now it's settling down. But I noticed uh, Pope Francis mm -hmm. has been talking about that, uh, has been talking about, you know, okay, you need discernment in your life. Mm -hmm. Because, in fact, he used Gaudete et Exultate, which is his latest document, he talks about discernment. He says, okay, you got the church with all its rules, you've got the Bible, you've got the scriptures, you get all things are set out before you, all the teachings are there, but everybody has their own path. He uses those words, everybody has their own road. And how do you know what your road is? Through discernment. And what is discernment? It's partly a gift, but partly you work at it. Is you try to find out what is, how is the spirit guiding you to you express the tradition in yourself, but in a creative way. 
I was reading John the twenty. And that, by the way, that just blows some people's minds. <laughs> and there's cardinals that are out to get Pope yeah. Francis yeah. because he's not hewing to the tradition as tightly as they want. But he's not throwing out the tradition. He's just saying it has to be applied freshly. You know, I was reading John the twenty third and you know Vatican II and all that, and he said we're discovering new things about the gospel that we didn't know before. Yeah. And they think that's going on today too. That we're discovering new things that we didn't yeah. we didn't know. We have more insight or something. Into yeah. Well, what did they think in Jesus' time? What's he doing? You know, he's, he's not doing things the way he's supposed to do yeah. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was the enemy for Rome. Oh. I add to what Frank said that I think I might be a couple years older than I am, but I never questioned anything. I just I just went along with it, and I find now that I'm getting older that I do question more, you know, and I want to understand more. Where before it was what I was ever I was told, and I find now in some of our younger people where they're. Um, wanting to do like you're sharing your daughters and that and I just went my own with blinders up and and I admire these younger people that are, like give their birthday presents away and stuff but even these little kids well I never would have thought to do anything like that I just was mm -hmm. I don't want to say a dumb little kid but I was you know and I didn't didn't question anything now too late to start well I am now I want to, <laughs> yeah I want to understand the, the Bible more I put that button here somewhere Oh, oh, okay. that oh, well, that's it. Okay. Let's see. And Kathy, you mentioned something when you first spoke about having issues in your life that seemed that they would stop you, but you moved beyond them. Yeah. You want to say anything more about that? No. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Uh, let's see. Resolve. Okay, so flexibility, the ability to bounce back. But then the need for resolve, to do whatever is necessary, no matter the defeat and the bruises accumulated along the way. And that takes a lot of courage to get to the point where you can say, I know this is going to hurt me, but it's something I have to do to stretch to the next level. And there's no age limit on these things, because there's continual things being put in our path that we either get stopped by or we adapt to when we have the resolve to go over them. Resilient people are somehow not only able to withstand, but benefit from certain kinds of stressful events and turn out <laughs> adversity into advantage. I think part of that's personality, like we said. Like in the charismatic group I was talking about on Monday, there's this little girl, three, four years old, just a beautiful child, and she's always running around making friends with people. And her brothers are sitting in the pew, kind of dutifully, not even dutifully, they're just there. <laughs> and the personalities could not be more different. And you know, I can just imagine that she's going to be a person that takes on challenges. Henry, Henry Nouwen talks about uh, we experience ourselves as both blessed and broken. And often brokenness, whether failures we are responsible for or slights we have suffered, come to dominate the story, clouding our memory. So we look back and we go, oh, my life has been nothing but trouble. You know people like that, right? You ever met a person like that? <laughs> Please. You know, the drama. Everything's a disaster. And they can tell the story, and you've heard it, you know, enough times. And, and, ah, oh, just getting through life is hard. I know a woman that is just sighs like that, telling you her, the story of her day. <clears throat> and then I couldn't find a parking place. <laughs> <laughs> we know people, we've been there, right? We've done these things. But in resilience, the blessing of life remains dominant. So looking at the whole picture, the ambiguous events of our lives may be remembered anew. <clears throat> but the blessing, the blessing part in the ascendancy, the blessing in my life is the important thing. It's remembered. We pull our brokenness away from the shadow of the curse and put it under the light of blessing. How many people have read Henry Nouwen? Yes. Yeah. Oh, what I recommend it. And talk about the adventures that he's, you know, he decided, I have not enough adventure in my life. I think I'm going to go and work in a place where the people are profoundly disabled. And so he went to, what's the name of the place? Large. Large. Large yeah. community in north of Toronto yeah. um, by the name of <coughs> oh, uh, Day, Day, no, Dayspring. 
Is that yes, it? yeah, I think yeah. so. And he worked there for three years taking care of this profoundly disabled man. Yeah. I don't know if I would have the courage to do that. But you know, a person that would take on challenges just so he would know how God might be calling him. Spirituality is so now let's move to spirituality. <coughs> spirituality is a certain way of being in the world. So we know about religion and beliefs and dogmas and and uh, um, practices, spiritual practices, and going to mass and various rituals. We know all about that. But spirituality is a way of being. It's kind of a personality towards the world, a spiritual personality. What is it you do every day? That's your spirituality. It's thought to encompass a search for meaning, for unity, for connectedness, for transcendence. Robert Eamon said, this is from a psychological point of view. So even if you put aside dogma teachings, whether you believe in God or not believe in God, there is a sense of something that's transcending your life, that you're part of something bigger. So people can have a spirituality, they might not call it that, that is, involves self-sacrifice and being part of something bigger than themselves, even if they might not believe in God. Embedding one's finite life within a grander, all-encompassing narrative appears to be a universal human need as the inability to do so leads to despair and self-destructive behavior. <coughs> An all-encompassing narrative. You know that's so hard nowadays? To talk about there is no narrative anymore that suits everybody. It's all like, well, you have your beliefs, and I have mine, and you, know, you believe in science, and I believe in religion, and you, know, you believe in something else. We, we have trouble finding an all-encompassing narrative. But somehow, if you can find one, it's really good. <clears throat> Pentecost, coming up this weekend, right? Yes. Coming up Sunday. A group of dispirited disciples gathers in an upper room. The Holy Spirit, like a strong driving wind, comes in, rattles the doors and the windows. Then it's like tongues of fire come upon them. The disciples burst out of the room. They were dispirited, they were fearful, they were locked inside. They burst out and they start talking and people understand them. And some people are going, oh, they're drunk, so listen to them. Other people are going, what is that's babbling. But for some people, they understood it. And that's understood as a gift of tongues, that they were understood to all the Jews who had come from various parts of the world for the Feast of Pentecost. Okay, skill of recruiting. This one is really important. And for an infant, you know, it seems to come naturally. Like your, like your uh, new grandchild. Everybody, oh, coo, 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 oh, you're just so cute. Oh, look at the hair, oh. Ignore oh, your no hair. <laughs> yeah. Well, they draw these things out of us. As adults, we become blathering idiots in front of a child. <laughs> oh, he's so cute. Look at that smile. I know he's smiling at me. That's what an infant does. An infant recruits people. Think of that skill. We once had it. <laughs> Until we became obnoxious. We were getting cute in those days. <laughs> How can we not lavish attention and concern about a beloved child? Unconsciously but effectively, the infant recruits our care, the engaged concern, and will ensure the child's survival. That's a skill. I mean, it's an unconscious skill sometimes. But when you get older, you have to choose to do it. I think I'm going to make friends with my mom. You know what? Even though after all the conflicts we've been through, we're adults, let's, let's be friends again. That, can, that sometimes happens, right? Or I'm in a church and I don't know who to, how to talk to, who are the people in this church, what do they need to hear, etc., etc. You start to make friends with a few of the people in the church. And you start to recruit people to help you for what you're going through, and that's community. Capacity to forge vital and enduring bonds with others. Crudability. Okay, now I got a good negative example. Uh, this is another video clip. Let's see what. Where did you say? This one? This one. No. Okay, don't look at the name. This is a, a short clip. I might play it twice. Oh, wait. Let me, let me uh, just give the. Uh, I don't know. I'll just show it. 
go there again. <sighs> yawn. He was yawning. Now I'm yawning. Does anyone know the story of Manchester by the Sea? <clears throat> Rachel, this is Lee. Hello, Lee. Yeah, this hi. is Rachel. Hi. Uh, Mrs. Dillon. Hi. Uh, you can't see him too bad. Hi, Dylan. Very handsome. Honey, you want me to get the car pick you up? Yeah. Oh, that's okay. I gotta, I gotta go. Uh, actually, can, can we, um, can we talk for a second? Sure. I'll just go around just be a few minutes. Okay, thanks. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Be right back. Um. I don't have anything big to say. It's okay. I just. I know you've been around and I. Yeah, just, I thought. Just been getting Patrick settled in. It seems like he's doing pretty good, huh? Considering. I think he is, yeah. I guess you don't know this, but I, uh. I really like kept in touch with Joe. No, it's kind of weird for me not seeing Patrick. Oh. Okay, I, I don't know. Uh, you could see him if you want. Could we ever have lunch? Mm, you're not seeing me? Yeah. I've said a lot of terrible things to you. No. But I know you never... <laughs> Maybe you don't want to talk to me. It's not that. Okay, but let me finish. Uh, however... My heart was broken. Because it's always going to be broken. But I know yours is broken too. But I don't have to carry. I said things that should fucking burn in hell for no. what I said to you. No, no, it, it no, was no, just... no, 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 no. Wait, no. I'm just sorry. I, I can't. I can't. I love you. Maybe I shouldn't say that. No, you can say that. It's just. I'm sorry, I've got to go. We couldn't have lunch. I'm really sorry, I don't think so. I thank you for saying everything she said. You just die. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I'm, I, I'm, and I'm, honey, I, I want you to be happy. Honey, and I, I see and you I, walking over here. And I, I just want to talk, tell you. I would want to talk to you, Ray. Really. Please, I, 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 no, I don't want to torture you. You're not, you're not torturing me. I just want to tell you that I was wrong. No, no. You understand? There's nothing. There's nothing there. There's nothing there. That's not true. That's not true. You don't understand. I don't know what this. I don't understand. I, I, I gotta go. Sorry. Honey, I'm sorry. Honey, I'm sorry. Would you please talk to the person next to you really quickly? What did you see? What did it mean to you? <clears throat> Yeah, there's just uh, miscommunication, complete disconnect.
It's a complicated story. It's a wonderful movie. So much acting. Oh, the yeah. acting. <sighs> Michelle Williams. Wow. And Casey Affleck. I mean, they're both. Uh, so anyway, they're married. They have two kids. He goes off. The big argument with his buddies and her, and she throws them out of the house because they've been drinking and they're too loud. He throws them all out. They sh she throws them all out. She goes back to bed. He goes to buy a bottle of beer or something. Forgets that the fire... He's put a log on the fire. It rolls out while he's away. The house just bursts into flames. She gets out alive. The two children do not. So that's the background of the scene, that she just cussed him out royally, hated him. Got remarried to another man, had a child. She's moving on with her life. He is stuck. He can't forgive himself. That's what I see in this, a negative example, because Here's a man that cannot forgive himself. She's begging him to forgive him, and he can't. He can't accept it. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to play it again. <laughs> I know it's, it's hard to watch though, isn't it? It's very painful. But when you look at it as an attempted forgiveness and a rejection of the forgiveness, who is he hurting? Himself. Both. He's hurting him and her. Yeah. Yeah. Right. When you can't be resilient, and you can understand why not. What, what he's done, he is so, he tried to kill himself. He is so guilty about what he's done. Okay, get out the hankies. Hi. 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 Rachel, this is Lee. Hello, Lee, this Hi. is Rachel. Hi. And this is Dylan. I can't see him today. Hey, Dylan. Very handsome. Honey, you want me to get the car and pick you up? Yeah. Oh, that's okay. I, I, I yes. say it uh, Actually, can, can we um, can we talk for a second? Sure. Okay. I'll just go around just be a few minutes. Okay. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Be right back. <sighs> um. I don't have anything big to say. It's okay. I just... I know you've been around and I... Well, just, I thought, just been getting Patrick settled in. It seems like he's doing pretty good, huh? Considering... I think he is, yeah. I guess you don't know this, but I, uh... I really kept in touch with Joe. No, it's been kind of weird for me not seeing Patrick. Oh. Okay, I, I didn't know. Uh, you could see him if you want. Could we ever have lunch? Hmm, I mean, you and me. Yeah. Um. Because I, uh... I've said a lot of terrible things to you. No. But I, I know you never... 
maybe you don't want to talk to me. That's not that. Let me, let me finish. Not... However, my heart was broken. Cause it's always gonna be broken. And I know yours is broken too. But I don't have to carry. I said things that I should fucking burn in hell for no. what I said to you. No, it, it no, was no, just... no, 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 Randy, no. I'm just sorry. It's, it's, I, I can't. I can't. I love you. Maybe I shouldn't say that. No, you can say that. It's just. It's, it's, I'm sorry. I've got to go. We couldn't have lunch. I'm really sorry. I don't think so. Uh, thank you for saying everything you, you said. You can't just die. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not I, I'm, and I'm, honey. I, I want you to be happy. Honey, and I, I see and you I, walking over here. And I, I just want to tell you. I would want to talk to you, really. Please. Please. I. 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 Please. Um, Please. I'm, I'm, I'm you gotta. You gotta know what. No, I don't want to torture you. You're not. You're not torturing me. I just want to tell you. But I was wrong. No, no, no. You understand? There's nothing. There's nothing there. There's nothing That's there. Not true. That's <laughs> not true. That's not true. You don't understand. And I don't I'm know what to say. Too. I know you understand. I, 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 I gotta go. I'm sorry. audience abuse. <laughs> I'm showing you that clip twice. <laughs> it's so hard to watch. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the virtue of resilience. Well, this is interesting. The capacity to forge vital and enduring bonds with others. To be able to forgive yourself so that there, there can be a relationship. And actually in the movie, some people here have seen it, it goes on and there's some hope at the end because he's developing, not with her, but he's developing a relationship with this young man that he's supervising. And he starts to see them, you know, becoming friends. And so if you can't do it in one situation, maybe you can do it in another. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Reframing. This is a nice skill to have. Refuse to be defined by the painful events that have happened. We have the ability to cast the movement, our lives, cast the movement of our lives in a new light. Perhaps abuse and neglect are not the full story. Perhaps my terrible mistake that cost the lives of two people is not the end of the story. Perhaps I'm not as bad as I think I am. Perhaps all those terrible, those terrible things I said. <clears throat> think about all the terrible things we've said. Perhaps all those terrible things we've said do not define us. That's the reframing. Put it, you know, move the picture frame a little bit and include some good stuff in there. What was the name of that movie? Um, we've all seen it a million times at Christmas. A Wonderful Life. What a Wonderful Life. <clears throat> yeah. Uh -huh. What happens well, in that story, Norma? Well, he feels that, you know, he's, he's failed his family and everything, you know, and he wants to commit suicide, and yet the angel comes. And does it reminds, what? It reminds him that he is worth something. Show, how does he remind him? Well, by seeing all of his past and what he did that was good. And if he wasn't there, 
yeah. none of those things would have happened, even though there was that one thing he couldn't forgive himself for. Yeah. There's no. Nice? I love that story. The angel shows him yes. all the things he's done in his life. Yeah, saw the good things. Reframes his yep. picture frame. And then he could see. Yeah. And they Isn't found the money he, anyway, right? This makes he ahead. wishes he'd never mm -hmm. been born. Yeah. So they show him what life would be like. Yeah. 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 It starts to touch you, doesn't it? It touches me, but then I cry at supermarket openings. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like, don't take my husband to the movie or play. He went and they had that play uh, through the civet. And I kept thinking, what's that noise? <laughs> it was my husband. <laughs> and I said, you've seen this movie so many times. I, I mean, this, and it's a play. And he's sobbing, uh, sobbing. <laughs> You picked a good one, it sounds like, to yeah. me. <laughs> Someone that can express what's really going yeah. on in there. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. I know this couple that comes to the Spanish Mass, and they're a young couple. They're in their, I don't know, late 20s. They're both working these incredibly hard jobs. He's packing feathers 60 hours a week. Oh. Into <laughs> packing feathers. He finally got a better job, but he did that for <laughs> about a year. Anyway, they work very, very hard. They come to church. She loves to sing, and he says, don't sing. Don't sing. Oh. You know why? Because if she's, he says, when she sings, it makes me soft. Yeah. And I go, well, what does that mean? Yeah. He, says, he says, it means I'll start to cry. Yeah. And I don't want to cry in front of everybody else. So don't sing. Oh, <laughs> oh. But, you know, just, and, and I do find that among the Latinos when we have any kind of gathering where people are talking about their life, pretty soon everybody's crying because of these incredibly hard situations they've been through and lives they lead and the fear and the splitting of families and all that. It's just right there at the surface. It's just amazing. And uh, <clears throat> one of the families said, oh, our daughter's coming up. Oh, your daughter, yeah. She's coming up from Guatemala. Yeah, she's our 15-year-old daughter. She's coming up. I go, how is she coming up? She's walking. Oh, wow. She's walking by herself. <clears throat> and about two weeks later, there she was. I'm going, that's, to me, it's magical thinking. How does all this yep. happen? Yeah. yeah, but it happens. Anyway. Yep. So there's resolve. We're going to get through this. The crucial is the witness of those who have suffered grievous injuries and yet continue to manifest courage and grit. So having role models is really important. And people are willing to stand up and talk about it. Talk about what they've been through and how they can still go on. Oh, we, got to, we talked about Malala. Uh, Paul says in Romans, we hope for what we cannot see. Hope is not hope if its object is seen. We hope for what we know we cannot accomplish. We have hopes for what we cannot account for. And uh, uh, one author said it's like an unintended envoy from another country or another world. Hope is that this, you don't hope for it because you know what it is. You hope that something's going to be there. Hope envisions alternate futures. The future holds more than more of the same. Hope alters the past, reminding us we can forgive the old injuries and dissolve ancient grievances. Like what, you know, we saw in the movie clip. Unable to forgive the injury, the old injury, even if we can't forgive ourselves. Uh, Isaiah, the prophet. These are the beautiful verses of chapter 40 through 44 in that part of Isaiah. You know, come to the water and all that. <clears throat> beautiful. Oh, that's from uh, the uh, Hallelujah chorus. It's drawn from those verses of Isaiah. Behold, I'm doing something new. Now it breaks forth. Do you not perceive it? So hopeful people become even more determined they adapt more easily to the unexpected circumstances. When one door closes, they look for another to open. I'm standing in your way. <clears throat> Those who hope will often discover untapped resources in the midst of a difficult situation. So have you noticed that about some people? They go, it's going to work out. It's going to work out. It is. I know it's going to work out. And it does. And there's some people who are able to have that kind of hope. And then there's people that are moping around going, oh, this is terrible. You believe how bad the situation is? Yeah, it's bad, but there's hope also. And hope is hope for what we cannot see. 
but you can have a hopeful personality. Just like you can have a little kid can be an adventurous, outgoing personality. There's some kids who are just hopeful, and you grow into that personality. And I really wish I could change my personality <laughs> from when I was a kid, because I was this shy little, uh, you know, always afraid of the other guys and everything. And I'm going, man, that was, but that's who God put me to be. So, okay, that's who I am. But you work with what you have. Mature hope leans into the future, ready to act when these actions can do some good. So that means an attitude of hope makes you ready for when the situation presents itself. And most of us are like waiting around because all these terrible things are happening. But that's because we don't have the virtue of hope. When you're going through it, though, you don't know that. No. When you're, when you're you know, down, you, you can't see hope. It's only after you've been through it, you yeah. look back and you say, oh. But when you're in the midst of it, no. We just said this funeral last week, the woman lost her only daughter. And this daughter was kind of like her in personality. They were like buddies. They were just, the daughter was 29 and the mother is, I don't know, in her 40s, maybe early 50s. And uh, her sisters were around her when it happened. I came over to the house. The daughter just died in her sleep. And they don't know why. She did have a long-term uh, kidney disease. But anyway, she died in her sleep. And the mother was just screeching, just screaming. Why, God? Why? And just inarticulate groanings and screechings and that went on for hours and her sisters were there to just hold her but she was grieving and she grieved hard and the whole week she was grieving that first day was the most of it anyway we come to the funeral she's beaming she's smiling in the front row and i'm going and she had threatened not to come <laughs> i said if she doesn't come i'm going over there in my car and i'm going to get her and bring her here but she came and she was beaming, and I said, Fran, you are the role model for the whole congregation. She goes, I'm really sad, there's a hole in my heart, but we're sending my baby home, and she's going to heaven, and we're sending her right now. This is an African-American family, and the cultural traditions there helped her to do that. She could grieve, she could screech and yell and cry out loud, and not every family can do that. Yep. And it's true. Not every family, some families are like, let's shut it in because I'm not good to cry. She let it all out. And she did grieve. And then she's able to be joyful as well. And that's the hope. The hope is my daughter's going to heaven, going someplace good. How do we expand our capacity for mature hope? Simple answer emerges. We learn to hope well in the company of hopeful people. So if you want to become like something, hang out with the people that already do that, and then you learn how to do it. And maybe even someday people will hang around you because you are a hopeful person. <laughs> Realizing that a part of reality is greater than ourselves, that we are part of a reality greater than ourselves. We are set free to invest our lives in hopes that will outlive us. This is our Christian hope, that we're part of something that's going to outlive us. We're part of a tradition that's been there before us and is going to be there after us and we're like one of the stepping stones. We're confident that God will ultimately prevail, which is our Christian hope. Even in the cross and everything, God is ultimately going to prevail. So gratitude has a lot to do with being resilient. Gratitude is an arousal of remembrance, a moral memory that binds together those who have exchanged gifts. Mm. Those who have exchanged gifts, mother, daughter, father, son, brothers, sisters. An arousal of remembrance binds people together because we've exchanged gifts. Have you ever tried to give a gift to somebody that will not receive it? <laughs> Take this. No, I don't want it. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Why don't, I, why don't you want it? Because I don't want to be in your debt. I'm not going to take that because then you're going to expect something from me. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's relationship. That's moral memory. A sense that, yeah, we do exchange. Not like it has to be, you gave me something that cost $40, I have to give you something that cost $40. But it's just an exchange, a free flowing of gifts that helps create community. Yeah, my dad used to always say that. He said, when somebody gives you a gift, never say you didn't have to. He said, you take that joy away from that person. Yeah, beautiful. And he says, when you accept the gift, you give them joy. Nice. And I always remember that because I, I suppose maybe I did that with somebody and he reminded mm -hmm. me of that. Sure. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. 
know, the other person. Giving a gift is, is gives joy yes, to both sides. So you don't yeah. reject the gift. You, you know, <coughs> be grateful. Yeah. 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 So mm. you have much wisdom. <laughs> I'm just smiling because I'm thinking when I was in Africa, part of my sabbatical was I got to go to Africa for four months. It was a pre-sabbatical out of Los Angeles. And I got to go to this place, um, Tamale in the north. And uh, they had a tradition there of giving gifts. And they, but they would always say, what did you bring me? <laughs> <laughs> and if you didn't bring something, oh my God, that was a social faux pas. You better bring something. <laughs> Aware of the ways in which we have been blessed, we respond with greater sensitivity to the needs of those around us. So there's the gratitude thing. Like, I always tell people, you know, people come to confession, to talking about their families, oh, I'm in trouble in the family. I go, do you guys ever sit down around the table and just pray together? <clears throat> sit down around the dining room table, get everybody to put down all the screens and turn everything off and just sit and pray together. And then, but not just pray, pray gratitude. Even though you're making me angry, I'm so thankful that you are in my life. I'm so thankful that I have this pet dog. You know, the kids can take part of this too. I'm so thankful for my hamster. It makes me so happy. Pray a prayer every day of gratitude with the whole family. It makes such a difference. And I always tell the adults, it's like you guys are the spiritual leaders of this household. And you are the ones that set the tone. Whether you're a man or the woman, you are, the spirit, you are a spiritual leader of this household. Start early in your relationship with gratitude, with you know, praying together. Sometimes we resist expressing or even expressing gratitude, concerned that this will put us in a place of indebtedness. But that's part of the bond of society. <clears throat> Psalm 25. Though you have, okay, resilience and aging. This might be of some interest to some of us here today. <laughs> uh, Though you have made me see many troubles, many and bitter, you will restore my life again. From the depths of the earth, you will again bring me up. Psalms are just this prayer book of the Jewish community and also of the Catholic community. You got every emotion in the Psalms. From joy to down to bitter depths to jealousy to enemies to hate. It's all there but you will again bring me up. So reframing becomes significant as we age. Our attention more cons considers the days that will remain to us. Okay, so you can look back and say, oh, I had all these great years, it's remained 66 great years. But what am I thinking about now? I'm thinking about the next years that are coming. You know, okay, between now and 70, am I gonna really achieve what I wanted to achieve in my life? I'm really thinking these things. And what is it? I don't even know what it is now. <clears throat> Because my attention and energy is spread all over the place. I'm spread thin like a peanut butter sandwich. And I would so like to say, this is what I was all about. Right there, that's what I was all about. So I'm looking forward to saying, I still got a legacy. There is an urgency. If we are to make a course correction in love or in work, now is the time. And that really came up in my life. It was about 10 years ago now. I took a leave of absence from the priesthood. And it was the best thing I ever did. Because I was thinking, oh, my vocation is because of Father Ken, who was my, you know, role model, mentor. Or my vocation was because of my mother. And I wasn't sure whose vocation is this anyway. So I talked to the leadership of the community, and I said, I need to take a, uh, I need to take a sabbatical, a time off. Not even a sabbatical. I don't need to leave the priesthood. And they said, okay, it's your life. <laughs> and... Uh, they, and they supported me in it financially so that I could do that for four years. I don't think I've ever told this here in Grand Rapids. So. Shh, just don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's just between us. Oh, and whoever is watching us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, could you rewind the reel just a little bit? No, no, it's okay. It's, <laughs> it's okay. Because it's part of who I am. I took this break, and then I decided it was right to come back. Probably because I was teaching high school during those years and I was like, <laughs> no, this is not my life. <laughs> you the they don't chew gum in the were CIC. You the Yeah, I was. You were. Okay. I was. Interesting. But no, it was, it was well thought out. It was a discernment process. And at the end of that four years, 
I said, you know what, it really is my vocation to be a priest. I know it. I don't have to question it anymore because now I know why I'm here. It's to share the love of Jesus Christ with people. I know what that is and I know why I'm here. It makes such a difference. So, why, why did I get off on that? Why are, if we're going to make a course correction, do it now and be bold. The dominance of the human spirit over its, I love this, the feast of losses. That should be losses. Or lo losers. <laughs> a feast of losers in my life. <laughs> it's a typo. The feast of losses, as the poet Stanley Kunitz has put it, to live and to watch daily the heroism of the elderly. And that's from Ronald Talney. To watch the heroism of the elderly. Oh, and that's from... My mother sent me, she sent me the clipping, she is my clipping agent. <laughs> this is from the Lake Oswego Review, and this is a fellow that reflects on life, and he lives in one of these homes, he doesn't name it, but I live in a home for the convalescent, and he's looking around at people, and they're going down, down, down in their physical lives, but still making sense out of life, and he says, the dominance of the human spirit can still make sense out of the feast of losses that we face. We discover that we can still do. The light still shines in our eyes. The simple pleasures remain. But each day can still be a jewel to cherish. Even when we're losing everything. Yeah. Uh, resilience. The recognition that I am more than what I do. See, that's important to a person like me who looks at what do I do and how is it valued. Ultimately, it is God's love, the ground that ground human dignity and the mature sense of self-worth. And so that's kind of the, one of the goals of aging is integrity. How do I put together what my life means? I can't go back and do it again. And the stuff that I wanted to do that I can't do now. And my life was all about what I care, who I cared for and what I did and what I achieved. Now none of that is there anymore. So how do I make sense of that? The mature sense of self-worth it's human dignity. It's my human dignity. It doesn't matter if I give good talks. It really doesn't. It doesn't matter if I say a good mass or, you know, do a good confession or go to the jail. It doesn't, none of that matters. What matters is my human dignity. And the same is true for you. Even as much as we do, you know, try to figure out what, how we do matter. A new or renewed commitment to self-acceptance struggles against a pervading sense of despair. Out of the conflict engendered by these opposing impulses, new strengths of the personality may emerge. So that's the problem, despair. <clears throat> and what do you do about that? That's the conflict. Okay, I believe God loves me, but I'm in despair. But somehow out of that, something new can come. New strengths of the personality may emerge. What is my contribution now? As we mature through creativity, as I mentioned, like creative, you go out and you create your tower, and as, as uh, Richard Rohr says, then you, in your 40s, you have to either jump off your tower or be pushed off your tower <laughs> so that you crash and burn, and then you have a whole <laughs> new life that depends on going depth of spirit. He says it so well, but in any case, we probably all know what it's like to crash and burn, <laughs> except the young ones among us. You, might have, you probably haven't got there yet, but that's all right, you'll get there. <laughs> it's a gift, it's too. It's coming. <laughs> and it's a gift. <clears throat> New stage of fruitfulness. The acceptance of one, this one really gets me. The acceptance of one's one and only life cycle and of the people who have become significant to it as something that had to be and that by necessity permitted no substitution. That's a happy old age. The people that were in my life and are still in my life and there's no substitutes. Those are the people that had to be there. That was the life I had to have. And here I am. You know, this is what 90 <laughs> looks like, or whatever. <clears throat> to accept one's life as the way it was supposed to be. That's quite a skill. Because you have to give away all, all the sense of loss and all the sense of oh, recrimination. Oh, if I'd only, you know, had a different marriage, a different family, a different job, whatever. But no, by necessity, it permitted no substitution. The ideals and goals that have inspired us will endure even beyond our lives. These values will outlive us, and in this we can rejoice. So there's again that Christian peace for us. If we're part of something that's bigger, 
we're part of, you know, we come to November 1st, All Saints Day, we celebrate the grand tradition that all the saints are sitting among us in the pews and they're up in heaven and they're all over the place. And the next day we celebrate the Feast of All Souls and the Dia de los Muertos is in there on the 31st somewhere, all these things. Ah, oh, just realize that we're part of a grand tradition and it's okay whether we, however we did, saint or sinner or whatever, we're part of it and it's going to go on. That's what 90 looks like. <laughs> okay, so that's the end of my presentation. We've come to almost 8.30. Are there any, is there anything you'd like to say? Or? Well, I think as one grows older, what you experience are people that are beginning to die. And they're leaving us, your friends, mm -hmm. your spouses. And those are the things that are very hard. Because um, I just went to a funeral yesterday of one of my best friends. And she just died. I mean, mm. she wasn't sick, nothing. <clears throat> and, you know, and a lot of uh, other friends, their husbands have died. And they said, that is the hardest thing growing over, is saying goodbye to different people. Even though you know that you're on the way <clears throat> to wherever you're, you know, going to yeah. meet them again. But it's that goodbyes, and all of a sudden they come rapidly. Yeah. Every month, there's somebody else. We're going right. to another funeral, another funeral, and it becomes more. It always reminds me of walking on a ridge, mm. and every now and then somebody falls off, <laughs> and it's one. That's a great <laughs> and then we look down, we go, "Oh, image. there, there's Joe." But you know, we pause. Yeah. Pretty soon there's five. Yeah. And pretty soon there's ten, and you kind of pause. And you go, "Oh, oh," and it's not that you're afraid to die. It's losing yeah. so many, and that I think is the hardest of saying goodbye. And you know you, but it's not the same. <laughs> it just doesn't. Yeah. yeah. That's what I find the hardest is right. growing older. Beautifully said. Yeah. But it, you know, it's part of life. Mm -hmm. And that's the resilience you have to have. Yeah. <clears throat> How do I go off, uh, you know, go on without that spouse or without that friend? Yeah. You know, what do I do? And, and you have to pause a minute and ask God to lead you so you won't be lonely or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or that you be able to do what you have to do without that person. Yeah, that's what most of my friends are saying. Yeah. So yeah. we appreciate every day. Yeah. Not that we didn't before, but more so. More so. What a great attitude. Yeah. yeah. You have to. Because you, know? you have a hole in your heart every time someone dies. Oh yeah. You but do. you're going on. You go on. Yeah. Yeah. But that reminds me of we're all on this.